Minister. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, as is uh, customary at the conclusion of a report stage, uh, I will uh, speak to um, the issues that have been raised rather than the full content of the uh, debate uh, as framed in the different amendments. Uh, let me start by saying, and clause, new clauses, let me start by, by saying how much I enjoyed and how much I congratulate my great friend, the member for Workington, on his uh, splendidly generous and warm uh, speech. And as was noted by uh, colleagues across the House, Workington will have a very fine voice in this chamber for many years to come. Uh, as that has shown. Uh, I was impressed by his ability to smuggle some Cumbrian dialect into the chamber, although I think I'm right in saying, I don't know if it counts as a foreign language, Mr Deputy Speaker, but um, uh, certainly it was um, unintelligible to me. <laughs> and, uh, it may also be true of other colleagues. Um, I take my hat off to um, not only to Mr Harris for identifying his um, prime ministerial potential, but also to his own robust sense of self-confidence that can cause him... People, colleagues normally play down their prime ministerial potential early in their political careers. Um, and uh, I, I um, admire his chutzpah, to use a different piece of dialect, to, uh, dialect um, in, in bringing our attention to it, um, especially in front of um, uh, uh, his acknowledgement of uh, his predecessor's capacity to align themselves with himself with the opposition um, and uh, in front of the whip. So I'm, I'm grateful to him for that. And he made some very valuable points in his speech. I congratulate him on his maiden speech. Uh, if I may turn to uh, the, uh, ele- the clauses raised in the speech, let me start with uh, Labour New Clause 29 and SNP New Clause 10, which require the Chancellor to review the impact on provisions in the Bill on child poverty and total poverty, respectively, and to lay a report before Parliament within six months of royal uh, assent. Um, now, we were treated to a very uh, moving speech, personal speech from the member for Ilford North, um, and I, I congratulate him on uh, his achievement in getting to Cambridge University on the back of that uh, personal uh, experience. Um, and, of course, he's right to focus on the importance of combating educational disadvantage, uh, a cause which every member of this House believes in. Uh, uh, what I found surprising was that he then didn't go on to acknowledge uh, the achievement of this government in raising the number of good or outstanding schools from 68% in 2010 to 86% uh, uh, um, <clears throat> today, or why he didn't go on to acknowledge that whereas in 2009-10 only 13% of 18-year-olds from disadvantaged uh, uh, backgrounds went to university, that number has gone from 13% to 21% in 2019. He talked about pensioner poverty, uh, but neglected somehow to mention that there are 100,000 fewer pensioners in poverty now than in 2010. He talked about jobs without acknowledging that, uh, at least until the pandemic, which has struck us all and um, has had, will have had un- unfathomable effects, as we know, um, 3.9 million people more were in employment, uh, and then specifically the employment of the poorest 20% uh, was 9% higher uh, under this government than in 2009-10. And, and he was right to say that <clears throat> the tragedy of economic crisis is if it hits uh, the least well-off uh, the hardest, and that is precisely what we as a government had to deal with, with the inheritance we had from our predecessors in 2009 uh, to 10. So these clauses, these clauses, the financial crisis of 2007-8, which as I've never ceased to remind the House, was brought about because bank leverage was allowed to rise from 20 times the previous 40 years to 50 times in seven years under the Blair government. Um, and if they don't believe me, they can look at the uh, Um, at the independent report on banking published under Professor Vickers. Um, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, these new clauses um, uh, are not uh, necessary because uh, the information they seek uh, largely is already in the public domain, including on the distributional effect of tax, welfare and spending uh, policies, uh, on the equalities impacts of tax measures uh, and data on poverty rates uh, as well. If I may come on to the other uh, one, I don't know if my right honourable friend, um, the member for Altrincham, <clears throat> is here to press or to discuss his probing amendment on new clause 30. I thank him very much for that. Um, I admire his range of reference. Uh, the first, I, th- I thought he was going to reference um, make reference to Stephen Colbert, the American talk show host, but tragically it was Jean-Baptiste Colbert um, who produced the line about um, uh, plucking the feathers from the goose. He's absolutely right. No one would describe him uh, as a hisser, 
Uh, but I can tell him that we absolutely pay very careful attention to the points he's made, and I'm very grateful to him for raising them. I'd also single out my right honourable friend, the member, my honourable friend, the member for not yet right honourable, but that was not long, um, uh, for Arundel. <laughs> Um, uh, who rightly pointed out that the configuration between the APD and the uh, environmental performance of those flights uh, is a very blunt uh, relationship indeed. Um, so I thank him for that. Uh, as as, these, as uh, these colleagues will be aware, as colleagues across the House will know, New Force 30 requires, uh, would ask the Treasury to review the effect of proposed rate changes on APD, air passenger duty. Uh, we are working very closely with the sector. We're very closely attuned to the concerns that it has in the face of the pandemic. Uh, and, of course, uh, we've paid close attention to the points that he has raised. Um, the, I'm sure colleagues will be aware that even as it is, the current rate will only take effect um, uh, as in April 2021 and only rises by two percent. So, it, it, uh, sorry, by two pounds uh, for a long haul economy flight, which is the cost uh, of a rather inexpensive coffee at airport prices. So, um, it may not be quite as uh, urgent, but the wider need to look at this, I think, is uh, well made. Um, let me, if I may, point quickly, turn quickly now to Amendment 4, which seeks to uh, extend the exemption for, from vehicle excise duty for medical courier charities in Clause 80, to ex explicitly to include vehicles carrying human breast milk. Um, the Honourable Lady, um, I think, will know that this amendment is not necessary because the clause already provides for the transportation of human breast milk. The purposeful vehicles used by the medical courier charities uh, exempt from VED do not, of course, merely transmit blood or transport blood. They transport a wide range of medical products, including x-rays, MRI scans, plasma and human breast milk. Um, there are many other things I could uh, say to respond to other comments, but uh, let me leave it there. The question is that new clause 19 be read a second time. As many as of that can say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that new clause 19 be added to the bill. As many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. With the leave of the House, I will put a single question that the remaining government new clauses and new schedule be read a second time and added to the bill. The question is that Government New Clauses 20 to 25, Government New Clause 32 and Government New Schedule 1 be read a second time and added to the bill. As many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Consideration completed. Third reading, what day? Now. Minister to move. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the bill be read a third time. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this finance bill uh, stands in the shadow of a pandemic unprecedented in its scale uh, and reach. And we are keenly aware of the immense challenges and pressures that that has placed upon us. Uh, these conditions, this situation cannot and will not uh, be ignored. The government is working flat out to alleviate the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, on the public finances and, most importantly, on the health and well-being of every person and family in the United Kingdom. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has announced numerous measures over the past few months in response to this virus, including the Job Retention Scheme, the Business Interruptions Loan Scheme, the Self-Employment Income Scheme. Together, this represents, contrary to many of the comments made in the previous uh, debate and uh, an economic intervention by government on a scale hitherto unseen uh, in peacetime and necessarily so. At such <clears throat> a difficult time for millions of people around the United Kingdom, the government has worked to protect businesses and uh, specifically focused on the well being of the most vulnerable in society. Now, of course, we recognise, the House must recognise, that this is a still a work in progress and there is a way to go. The crisis is not over. The pandemic continues. People around this country are still suffering and uh, may do so for many months yet. The gov government will continue to work to lessen the impact, but it remains the responsibility, the duty, the important role of businesses, of families and individuals to play their part too in this colossal collective national effort. Together, we must work to bring ourselves through and out of this crisis. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill supports emergency services as they go about their vital duties. It exempts from vehicle excise duty 
vehicles that have been purpose built to transport NHS products. Uh, the Government has introduced new, new clauses which were considered today and that ensure that workers who have returned to public sector jobs to help fight the effects of this pandemic will face no adverse pensions consequences from doing so. It reforms the tapered annual allowance so that doctors can spend more time treating patients without facing precipitous tax bills. This pandemic has brought out in many ways the best in our society and I am certain that the Britain that emerges from this pandemic will be stronger and fairer. The Bill provides tax exemptions specifically for those who receive payments under the Windrush Compensation Scheme, the Troubles Permanent Disabled Scheme and the Kinder Transport Fund, <clears throat> as well as for care leavers who are starting apprenticeships, and very rightly so. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, necess <clears throat> excuse me, the necessary focus on the here and now must not come at the expense of tomorrow. In the words of the Prime Minister, our great national hibernation is coming to an end, and we must and will now at last look to the future. Now is the time to start to rebuild the economy and to restore our public finances. Uh, our police, our teachers, our armed forces, many other public sector workers have all played their part in combating this pandemic uh, uh, alongside the NHS. Uh, I would also single out, as I have said, uh, public servants within the civil service and uh, in particular in my own area, in the HM Treasury and with HMRC. Uh, this support, this public sector support, cannot be provided for if the public finances are not uh, supported in turn with a fair and sustainable tax system. That is a key, key fact. Uh, we do that while seeking to remain competitive uh, internationally, and maintaining the corporation tax rate at 19% uh, is therefore the right approach. Even at that level, it's still the lowest headline rate in the G20 and reminds the world of the UK's strength as a location for inward uh, investment. But we've also been clear about fairness. Everyone must pay their fair share of tax, and that is one reason why we have introduced the digital services tax for which this bill also legislates. A tax set at a rate of 2% on revenues from digital services will ensure that digital businesses pay a fair share of UK tax, or fairer share, uh, one that more accurately reflects the significant value that they derive from their UK users. We want that as we look to recovery, business uh, to receive the support that it needs, and that is why we have delayed the extension of the off-payroll working reforms to the private sector to April 2021. Uh, businesses need time to prepare for these reforms, and it would have been burdensome to ask them to do so during the pandemic. We focus on innovation in this finance bill. We wish to go further to support enterprise in this country, which will be desperately needed in the coming months. This country has a very proud history of innovation. And increasing the research and development expenditure uh, rate from a credit rate from 13 to 13% will allow that to continue. Uh, the structured and buildings allowance rate increase will also aid investment in new shops and factories, agricultural buildings, helping to stimulate capital investment across the nation. Uh, as ever, we are committed to levelling up across the United Kingdom. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as has been pointed out. Uh, COVID-19 is not the only crisis that we face. The Government has committed to, re to reducing the United Kingdom's carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. This bill is another step towards that target. Not only does it pave the way for the forthcoming plastic packaging tax, it removes the vehicle excise duty expensive car supplement for zero emissions vehicles, and it ensures that now that we have left the European Union, a carbon price will remain in place. Together, these measures will help to ensure that our post-COVID-19 economy is greener than before. Uh, let me say one thing, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is at the end of uh, ten hours of debate in the last two uh, days, for which I thank all my colleagues, members of the opposition front bench, um, uh, we understand that the world during the passage of this bill it has changed, that its impact upon this House, upon our daily lives, upon our economic in outlook has radically altered. To some extent, we have made changes on the fly to shore up and support our public services and our response to the pandemic. As a result, this bill is a firm, indeed a firmer foundation than it was originally framed, upon which we can build, rebuild our economy and protect our public finances as we recover from this devastating virus. 
The bill supports businesses, it supports the vulnerable, it supports our key workers, and I commend it to the House. The question is that the bill be now read third time. Bridget Phillipson. Uh, thank you, Mr.